Good evening, everybody. My name is Dr. Rick Lehman, and I'm here with uh, some guest all-stars tonight in your corner with Cora, and we're talking about total knee replacements. And we're going to be pretty specific in terms of technique, rehab, etc. And again, we've got an all-star cast, which I'm going to have introduce themselves. Kinsey? Yeah, I'm Kinsey Schaus. I am a physical therapist for Cora, um, and I work out in the O'Fallon, Missouri Clinic. Dr. Steve Wynn? Yes, uh, Steve Wynn. I'm the founder for Optimotion Orthopedics. Uh, we do uh, orthopedic knee replacements uh, in the lab. And Nick? Hi, Nick Blair, physical therapist, uh, orthopedic specialist with Core Physical Therapy down in Orlando, Florida. Awesome. So let's just jump right in here. Uh, I'm going to start out with a, a scenario that I deal with frequently. I don't do total joints, but it's a scenario that is very tough for me. And uh, hopefully we can get some clarity. Um, in my office, I see a 35-year-old ex-NFL lineman. He comes in. He's got medial joint space loss. He's had five or six arthroscopic knee procedures. He has chronic pain. Maybe he's coaching somewhere, chronic swelling. He's having trouble standing for periods of time, can't walk up and down stairs. And he wants to know what I have to offer him. And uh, Dr. Wynn, you're going to be a leadoff batter here. What do you tell that athlete? Um, you know, usually uh, it's, it's a really complicated question for somebody that young. Uh, and it's, it really does involve a long conversation with them. You know, when you start entertaining and, and by the time they've come to my office, they're already committed to getting a knee replacement, even at that age. Um, so you do tell them all the, I spend a lot, a lot more time telling them what they have to do in the long run if they do choose to have a knee replacement. Uh, so, you know, knee replacement probably is going to give them the longest benefit as far as pain relief and return to normal function, but it also carries with it a lot of risks. Um, and so we spend a lot of time telling them, look, you know, you have to follow up every year. We got to make sure your liner's intact. It hasn't worn out the piece of plastic we inserted as part of a knee replacement. And that, that, that is a major part that, you know, you tell them about, you know, knee replacement is probably the choice for you if you've exhausted everything else, like bracing, therapy, um, you know, all the other treatment modalities that you can possibly uh, exhaust. And if you do choose to elect for a knee replacement, you got to take care of it like a car. You got to like do your checkups every year. You, you can't let your brake pads wear out because you'll rip your rotor and your, your axle completely off your, your car. So that's kind of like how I, I approach that, that subject. That's excellent. So who, who's your prototypical totally perfect candidate? And then kind of give me the limits of, of who else might be a candidate. Um, you know, the ideal candidate is someone who uh, is expected to live another 15, 20 years, uh, because that's really how long a knee replacement is expected to last in an average weight person. The, uh, so, you know, if you look at the average life expectancy for someone in the United States, it's almost uh, 85 right now. The ideal candidate is in their 70s, uh, plus or minus five years. Okay. And, and if you're going to stretch the indications for a total knee replacement, give me, I mean, 35 sounds to me like pretty young, but again, there aren't any other answers, no, no reasonable answers. How young will you go in terms of somebody with end-stage degenerative arthritis and really no other options? Yeah, I think that, you know, we try to... Uh... Again, uh, once we've, we've identified that they've exhausted all the, you know, sports options that they can possibly do, cartilage, you know, whatever regrow procedures that they can possibly have done, then what we'll do is we'll talk to them about knee replacement and then we'll adjust our, our implant modalities to, um, from, a, from our personal standpoint, it's we want to preserve bone stock for a second surgery. So, you know, using uh, uncemented knees, um, we've had very, very, very good luck with it. Uh, and that really does help prevent, uh, uh, prepare you for a second surgery. And we tell them you got to bite the bullet and get a second surgery, you know, uh, and you have to decrease your activity. So, you know, the younger you are, the more likely you to be active, but 
you have to decrease your activity to keep it long, your knee lasting longer. So those are the things that you kind of have to like assume that the patient knows. Really excellent, thank you. What I want to kind of talk a little bit about is the rehab. So Kenzie, give us the immediate rehab, the same day rehab, and then kind of the long-term goal. What, what, what does rehab look like after a total knee replacement? Yeah, so immediate rehab and, and with different advancements in the knee replacement, it, they're coming quicker. I mean, see them sometimes the first week, we'll see them in outpatient therapy. The main, right away, the main thing, goal is to get knee extension back. That's the we want to get back. And then if they're coming in um, pretty soon after therapy, pain control, swelling, modalities, kind of getting the pain down, a lot of education, making sure... They can do things safely at home. They know what to avoid, what not to avoid. Um, but the main goal motion-wise is getting that knee completely straight as soon as we can. The, the window to get knee flexion back is a lot longer than the window to get knee extension back. So that's definitely a main focus um, at first. And then long-term, as they kind of progress through therapy, you're going to want to work on getting that knee flexion back, um, getting that quad strength back. The quad is really important to do a lot of the the functional transfers that you need, like getting off the couch, getting in and out of the car, um, going up and down stairs, um, trying to get that normal walking pattern back as soon as possible, kind of weaning off of the assistive devices as soon as possible as well. And what kind of flexion do you expect? Uh, what do you tell, tell your patients? Can you, someone comes in, what, what are your expectations for flexion? We know you want to get to zero or whatever contralateral knee extension is, but what do you tell them in terms of the flexion? What can they expect? You know, knee extension is the most critical function that you develop first. And then the reason why I always tell the patients that is that, you know, if you try to walk with your knee bent for any period of time, even the most athletic person cannot do that for any period of time. And the energy requirements on a flex knee is incredibly difficult. Uh, um, and so your quads will tire very quickly unless you can force it to, to a full extension. Um, functionally, you know, I, I tell, tell my patients that, you know, it really depends on, you know, design of the prosthesis, whether it's a high flex knee, how much their thigh circumference is. Um, functionally, you know, we, we tell them we want to be able to get down to 110 degrees of flexion and the 120 to 130 is really, you know, um, something that most of my patients are able to achieve, but it's not really required for a lot of whole functional uh, movement. Like the most functional thing that people want is to get to a roughly, to be able to bike a full bike cadence on a bike uh, activity wise. So that's what I would tell my patients. That's excellent, thank you. All right, Nick, you're up buddy. So activity expectations, um, what restrictions do you think you want to tell your patients to come in, they had a total knee replacement, maybe they had some rehab in the hospital, they were up walking the same day, uh, they're four or five days out, and now it's time, they're in the clinic early on. So the questions are, what are their activity expectations? What, what ultimately can they do? And then what restrictions do they have? What, what bad things are gonna to happen to their total knee? What do you tell them they can't do? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's so important that we're educating the patients on, you know, precautions that they need to avoid. So certainly anything where they're, or they're weight bearing and they're pivoting on that knee, we want to try to avoid those for a period of time as well. You know, our expectations is that by two weeks post-op, they should be ambulating without an assistive device, or at the very minimum, perhaps a straight point came. Uh, we'd like to start seeing that they're able to negotiate stairs, go up curbs, doing things a little bit more independently by that two to four week phase, um, educating them on just recognizing signs of infection, uh, really important to be doing like anti-embolism measures, so making sure they're not at risk for getting any sort of BVT, um, any sort of prophylaxis medication they need for those as well. And, and really just educating them to, to try to be patient. Uh, some of them really just want to go right out of the gate and, uh, you know, they want to go on vacation. They got the knee replacement so they can go visit their, their niece up in, in New York and go up a three-story brownstone. So we, we kind of kind of hold the reins on them for a little bit and let them know, you know, this is a three-month process. Let's be patient. 
let's make sure that we're, we're progressing appropriately. You know, Dr. Nguyen hit the nail on the head. You got to really avoid those compensatory gait patterns. You can't let them learn to walk with that knee bent. Once they start doing that, it's so hard to break that pattern. So, um, you know, it's just being very timeline oriented and, and really trying to make sure you hit milestones before you progress on to the next level. Awesome. So, Dr. Wynn, for, for all the listeners out there, explain a couple things. What, what is a minimally invasive total knee replacement? And explain navigation. What, what is it? What, what navigation? What, what does navigation mean as in relationship to doing an arthroplasty? Okay, so um, minimally invasive knee replacement surgery, for me, by definition, does not mean a smaller scar. Uh, minimally invasive knee replacement surgery means we do all steps possible to minimize soft tissue damage during the surgical procedure, uh, which involves muscle sparing approaches. Um, knee is actually particularly, you know, one of those challenging areas to do a muscle sparing approach on. Um, and then to answer your second question, um, what is navigation? Uh, navigation is, and the, uh, the other part of it, which would be kind of like tied into that is uh, the robot assisted navigation, is the ability to see the knee in CD space. Uh, to be able to see it uh, where you're going to make your cuts. So the length of time to do a navigated knee re replacement uh, is, is a little longer when during your initial setup. Uh, the main um, downside to it is you have to drill pins in your, your bones uh, to pins, uh, so that the, the robot or the, the navigation can set you are in real space. Awesome. Thank you very much. That is, that's excellent. Same question. Home exercises. When do you start quad strengthening? When's it safe to start quad strengthening? And yeah, absolutely. You know, post-op day one, still in recovery room, we're doing quad sets, glute sets, hamstring sets, basically isometric contraction. So making the muscle contract, but not a lot of movement at the joint. Uh, again, that helps with that DVT prevention, getting the muscle pumping. Um, you know, those are going to carry over to their home plan as they transition into outpatient physical therapy. We'll start progressing with the gait training, which is learning how to walk, leaning away from a rolling walker, maybe to a straight point cane, to no assistive devices whatsoever. We like to use a lot of uh, what we call closed kinetic chain exercises, which is where the foot stays in contact with the floor. You're weight bearing, sometimes with some support, maybe on a set of parallel bars or a counter, learning how to do partial squats, learning how to do quarter lunges, learning how to do step ups, functional activities. Um, eventually down the road, we could progress to open chain exercises, which is something you would consider like a knee extension where you're extending the leg out, but it, that's at physician's preference. Sometimes we tend to hold back on that a little bit. Um, and then from there, it just, you, you progress as the patient can tolerate, you know, once you hit your milestones, once you get 90 degrees of flexion, once you get full terminal knee extension, you could advance to the next level, um, progressing from a four inch step to a six inch step to an eight inch step to help them transition into the home and be safe there. Um, and then eventually we start working on things like uh, balance, two legged balance, one legged balance, balance on unstable surfaces so that they could walk through their front yard in the grass without losing, uh, you know, their, their, their balance and falling. It's awesome. Thank you. Oh, All right, Ms. Kinsey, you, you, the patient comes in and they want to know when they're mobile, when they go back to normal activities, when can they go to the store? When can they go for a walk? What do you tell them? How long does it take from the time of their surgery? for expectations in terms of normal daily activities, maybe not sports, because we'll talk about that in a minute, but just a normal functional day. Yeah, and um, kind of like what Nick was saying, within the first, like within two weeks, we like them to be um, off of their assistive device, walking with maybe just a straight point cane. So as we go to the store, we're working on that proper gait pattern pretty quickly. So within two to four weeks, we're hoping to get them just functional things like going to the store, like you said, or 
you know, going on a drive or going to pull on a walk outside, the more active you are in the beginning, the better at in point. You don't want to go crazy and do a lot of activity, but getting to be able to go on, you know, short walks, going to the store should be pretty quickly. Like I would say three to four weeks, you're probably being able to do those, those activities. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Nick, how do you, give me, give me some signs that, that their post-op rehab is in trouble. I know for my ACL, someone comes in, their knee's not straight. When I get done freaking out, you know, we have the same moment and we say, hey, we got to get extension, et cetera. How do you know after an orthoplasty when the patient's rehab isn't going well and, you know, we need to make a line change, we need to talk about a closed manipulation, uh, yeah. change, change protocol? Yeah, I mean, I think you hit on one of the things with the manipulation that that post-operative arthrofibrosis or that stiffening of the joint is always a concern, right? You know, we get these patients that have really poor ability to manage their pain. Uh, you know, you wouldn't believe how many people don't want to take the pain medication after surgery. And we really have to educate them while there is a small risk of potential addiction, um, there's a much larger risk of if we can't manage your pain, we can't progress you in therapy, right? So you kind of kind of have that, that difficult conversation with them. Make sure that they're medicating so they can tolerate us getting our hands on it, pushing that knee down flat, bending that knee to 120 degrees. Um, of course, anything like your cardinal signs, if we see some redness, if we see the skin is different in appearance compared to the other leg, gross swelling, uh, distal pulses being absent. These are all things that we're starting to think it's time to get a call in to doc, let them know we have some concerns here. Um, and, and then patients that are just, you know, displaying a lot of self-limiting behaviors, whether they can't take the pain or they're just fearful, you're gonna pop my knee replacement out, it's too early to be doing this. We gotta let them know, hey, that sucker's in there, it's cemented in there, or sometimes it's, it's pressed in there very well not going anywhere. You're okay. Um, so, you know, those are the big things that we commonly see is just patients that can't either handle the pain or, or, or maybe some, some post-operative complications like swelling or, or stiffness in the joint that we need to, you know, get doc to take a look at. Great. Thank you. So, Dr. Wynn, what, 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 what are you concerned about? Uh, give me a time frame when you're concerned about a loss of range of motion, inability to get extension, uh, lagging in terms of flexion. What, what, what are your, what are your, I know you have a very strict protocol. What are your time frames when you would get concerned? Yeah, so, you know, we follow our patients extremely closely, probably closer than, you know, uh, the vast majority of guys that do joint surgery. So we're doing, we're following them at the one week, the two week, and on almost a weekly basis. So by the two week mark, if they have not achieved uh, 90 degrees of flexion, we're, we're seeing them every week until we're satisfied with it. And then we start intervention either uh, with medicine to control their pain somehow, anti-inflammatories, if their wounds healed up, starting them on steroid dose pack to try to decrease the inflammation that's going on. You know, we do whatever we can to try to control their pain so they can start with their exercises again. And you know, you know, the studies clearly show that a manipulation within the first six weeks is far more beneficial than a manipulation after twelve after six weeks. So, you know, the the window to man, to to actually do a manipulation, and fortunately, we don't have to do too many of those. But uh, uh, we follow we just we just follow them like like paranoid people, to be honest with you. <laughs> From the moment we we get one of those, it's it's like uh, all alert in in our in our office. Uh, and then you you know you just start intervening as much as you can so that they can uh that you can you don't get for me the the if you have a problem it's a cascading issue like it it just tends to snowball out of control unless you're like uh on top of it so you know we do follow our patients extremely closely now if they have the stiffness thank you so a common question I get asked and again I don't do arthroplasties is what what sports can I play if I get my knee replaced. So they come in, I say, look, an arthroscopy is really not gonna help you. Let me send you to a total joint doctor. And their common question is gonna be, well, what can I do? Can I run? Can I ski? Can I play tennis? What do you tell them when they ask you what sports uh, or what activities uh, they can engage in after an arthroplasty? 
So <laughs> is actually, I tell them what they cannot do. So the two sports I'm sure that they cannot do is they cannot play basketball and they cannot play volleyball. Uh, we tell them to avoid jumping sports. Um, and we don't really stop them from the other sports. Uh, but we do tell them like anything that causes you to pivot where you would require an ACL, we highly recommend that you wear an ACL brace. Uh, so skiing, which I think is very ACL, you know, puts a huge tension on your, your ACL if you have it. Uh, so we tell them to wear an ACL brace and see if they can ski and then just don't do any moguls. So there are some limitations, but like, you know, for us in Florida and Orlando, the two sports, the only two sports people care about is golf, um, and golf. <laughs> golf and pickleball. Golf. Golf and tennis and uh, pickleball. So, I mean, which is, you know, we, we don't stop them from doing that. They, they actually get back to it fairly quickly with us, you know, within six weeks. Great. That, and that's a good answer. And actually, the studies do show that bumping up your activities don't increase your incidence of loosening. So I, I, I think that's a good answer. And again, I, I think golf probably, you probably tell them golf's not, yeah. not really much of a problem. Um, all right. Ms. Kinsey, oh, give me your experience in rehabbing bilateral total knees. Somebody comes in with one knee, certainly you can weight bear on the unaffected knee, et cetera. Um, how does that differ in terms of somebody with bilateral, bilateral in terms of rehab? Um, so I, from my experience, it's, it's been pretty rare in St. Louis to see a bilateral knee replacement. I've seen two or three since I've been out of um, your left knee replaced and you can kind of rely on that right knee, but if you have both of them replaced, the, the pain level is a lot higher initially, um, with, you know, motion and gait training and different things. It's the pain level at first is a lot higher from what I've seen. I, I completely agree. Uh, I've been in practice for about 10 years, and in that time, I've maybe seen a handful of patients that have underwent bilateral total knee replacements. I can't say I've seen great results with it. Um, you know, it's just a matter of what the body can handle as far as the healing process goes, and the time that we have in therapy with them. You know, typically our sessions are limited to an hour. So we can either have an hour to really get aggressive with one knee, or we have to split it between two. And Kinsey hit the nail on the head as well. You know, if they can't get off that affected extremity and, and take a break on the good knee or, or the better knee, I should say, it just makes it very difficult. Um, you know, these patients tend to have higher pain levels. Um, so, you know, from a rehab standpoint, I'm not always a fan of it. I, I have advised patients in the past if, if they have the time to do one at a time, recover, you know, six months later to the second one. From our perspective, it seems to work a little bit better from the physician side. You may have a different perspective, um, but in my experience, they, they don't do as well as they do when it's just the unilateral uh, arthroplasty. Dr. Wynn, I'm gonna ask you the same question. The patient comes in, they got two terrible knees, and the question they ask me, and again, I have no dog in the hunt, is uh, can I do both of them at the same time? So when you get that question, which you undoubtedly get that question, what do you tell your patients? Well, I, I think I can tell you that, and you know, I can give you some numbers and tell you, it gives you an indication how few I do. So we do uh, about a thousand total knees to 1500 total knees a year. Um, of those, uh, maybe one or two um, gets through our screening system to get uh, bilateral knees. And I can tell you universally, it's always, um, a male um, who lives out of our state and who's elected to travel, you know, say from Alaska. I remember we did one two years ago that uh, came over to us and, you know, they came from Alaska to get a knee replacement done. And so they said, we're only doing it if we can get both done at the same time. And I go, well, you're going to struggle, but I guess that makes sense. You know, they, they have to rent a hotel and live here for uh, a month. Uh, so, you know, we, we tend to be very, very uh, negative uh, on doing both needs at the same time. Uh, I see no reasons at all to do it if they live in our community. I think that's a good answer. And I think that's, that's probably not all that different than bilateral knee arthroscopies or bilateral rotator cuff repairs, et cetera. Um, you touched on this before, Dr. Wynn, but I'm going to ask you again, 
and, and again, this is the most common question I, I get asked. Um, and, and looking at the literature, I think your answer was a good one. But if, if, if a patient asks me, how long does a total knee last? Um, what do you tell them? And what do you tell them in reference to how old they are versus their activity level, et cetera? Kind of go through that again, because you really touched upon that and you did a good job. What do you tell somebody? And, and what are the different age ranges that you tell them maybe a little different? Right. So, you know, if you take a 38 year old rheumatoid arthritis patient, uh, that's a totally different outcome versus a 38 ex NFL player who weighs 350 pounds. And you're trying to figure out what, if they really, he's really going to go through it with it. What, what potential implant can you put in him that will last him as long as possible? So, you know, an average person, average weight, uh, we tell them, you know, 15 to 20 years, um, we do tell them like, you know, if they're on the younger side, I always lean towards telling them, Hey, listen, you know, you are younger, so you're going to bite the bullet and get a new, a second surgery. So instead of trying to get a full revision, why don't you follow up very closely, you know, and get x-rays every year, um, be religious about it, pick your birthday and come in and we take an x-ray and we, we compare x-rays every year. And if you're, you exhibit any signs of anything, it's a simple enough thing like I said, using the car analogy to change out a brake pad versus ripping everything out. And um, so, you know, knee revisions encompasses, you know, changing out a brake pad or changing out the liner ver and, or maybe revising the kneecap uh, versus chiseling everything out. And uh, we tell them, I go, if you follow up every year, you know, especially when it hits the 10 year mark, um, you know, the revision may not be as bad as you think it is. Um, and so, um, I think that's kind of like where I, I would lean on every, every, every patient you see, you know, that's younger, uh, and you want to lean towards that indication, you, you, you spend a little bit more time explaining them to the, the consequences of it. Thank you. All right, Nick. So how important is the functional movement to sit to stand in the result of a, a total knee? And I know this is a specialized question for people that do a lot of total knee rehab. You know, we do the single hop test for our ACLs and we have dorsal V. Um, and I know all my, my partners that do all the arthroplasties are constantly talking about the sit to stand. So why don't you discuss that a little bit, the results and, and, and kind of how you use that as a guideline. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's one of the most functional movements, right? In order to get in and out of the car, in order to sit down, to have your meal, to use the toilet, that sit to stand needs to be there. So typically on day one, we'll do what's called a repeated chair stand test, which is the maximum amount of time that it takes an individual to do five sit to stands. If they need to use upper extremity support to push on the armrests, we allow that in the beginning just because they don't have that quad strength and that glute strength. And then usually over time, over, you know, every week or every two weeks, we're reassessing how much quicker can they do those five times at the stands. Can they progress from using two hands to push off the chair to one hand to no hands? Ultimately, the goal is the criteria for discharge is an individual should be able to do about 10 sit to stands without using their hands pretty independently without a loss of balance. That's when kind of we feel more comfortable that the patient's going to be safe for discharge. Um, you know, the worst thing you want to do is get someone in the habit of, of always reaching to pull on something because that's not always going to be there. You know, we've always found ourselves in that middle cushion of a very, very low couch. And, and that's not a great position to be in when you, when you've learned to push your whole life. So, um, it's probably one of the most functional movements outside of a squat that we pay a lot of attention to. Excellent. Thank you. So what is the protocol for prehab. What, what does a patient need to do getting ready for a total knee replacement? How does rehab play a part in that component and what can they do at home? And when should they start that activity in terms of getting ready, starting their prehab as it relates to when they're gonna get their arthroplasty? So usually in terms of when you start the prehab, um, exercises. Usually I get scripts, usually four to six weeks before um, their surgery to start kind of doing the prehab stuff. It's, it's a lot similar to what you're going to be doing immediately 
things. Studies have shown that the more motion you have in your knee, you recover and you get back to that normal gait pattern and you, the quicker you get the motion back. So I focus a lot on knee range of motion, flexion, extension, um, and then quad strengthening and glute strengthening. Um, prior to the surgery, they're in a lot of pain. That's why they're deciding to get the knee replacement because their knee is in a lot of pain. So you're limited a little bit on strengthening, but it's just about finding, usually it's non-weight bearing strengthening of the quad and the glutes and then knee range of motion um, prior to the surgery. Excellent. So Dr. Wynn, um, we're gonna wrap it up. And, and what I would like you to do is, is explain your approach, uh, possibly the lateral approach, but your approach surgically and in general, uh, in terms of you replace the patella, um, what's your approach to a total knee replacement in terms of surgical approach and explain why that is a preference of yours. Okay. Um... So, you know, first of all, let me piggyback on uh, um, the comment about rehab. So for me, recovery starts well before surgery ever happens. You know, preparation, preparation, and preparation. So we have a set of exercises we always strictly follow. And if you can't follow it, we actually say you shouldn't have surgery. Um, and it's two weeks. We ask for two weeks of exercises. Because I find that if you ask for people who are in pain from knee, re from knee arthritis to ask them to do more than two weeks, they just tend to stop after two weeks. And then, then they go through atrophy and stiffness afterwards. So what we do exclusively in our practice, uh, all the surgeons actually uh, in our group um, do a lateral approach to the knee. It's a fairly uh, unique approach and not used as often, actually probably not used at all in the, most of the country. Um, because uh, we started, I started about doing it about, you know, 10 years ago, eight to 10 years ago. We have like 8,000 cases we've done. We do it almost exclusively for all our primary knees. Um, and it is the muscle sparing approach that I think personally that I've gone through everything um, that is the one that is the, gives me the best outcomes. Uh, the patients tend to be in less pain. Their quads activation is far simpler right after surgery. Um, uh, they don't have, you know, quads atrophy quite as much. Um, and so the approach involves going on the outside of the, the knee instead of a midline incision. So you have less saphenous nerve uh, injury, a sensory nerve uh, over the anterior aspect of the knee. In fact, you don't have any of that actually. Uh, we think the lateral approach is important because the kneecap tracking, because you're going lateral anyway, so your kneecap is always tracking perfectly. You never have to worry about the kneecap not tracking. Um, you know, in the last, I think, 3,000 knees, we've never had a kneecap tracking issue. Um, and, but it is a technically difficult uh, surgery to, to master uh, for, for other people. Uh, but, you know, we seem to have, you know, our protocol set where everybody gets it done and, um, you know, they go home now the same day. Uh, we initiate all the therapy that, you know, Nick, Nick uh, uh, has described uh, and, and Cora does for us. And, uh, you know, we're, we're off to the races. Like I said, most of our patients are back to their normal activities within six weeks. So that's, that's the approach. And do you find the exposure um, difficult or is it just something you get used to going lateral versus uh, midline uh, or is it just like most things just a learning curve? It's very similar to, um, I don't know, you're familiar with the anterior approach to the hip, which is the muscle sparing approach to the hip. It's, you know, there's a learning curve involved in it. Uh, once you achieve the significant uh, volume, then, then uh, all of a sudden it takes off and it becomes extremely simple. Uh, you know, I've taught, you know, both my partners and, and they don't seem to have any issues. In fact, they probably wouldn't go back. Longevity wise, I will tell you, it is the best approach for knee replacement surgeons because you're operating on the same side, regardless of right or left knee. 
you know, when you're, 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 you're right-handed and you're operating on a left, on, on a right or left knee that, you know, you have to cut on the other side, your back really suffers. Longevity wise, we're always on the same side of our skin incision. So it really helps quite a bit. That's really interesting. And that's really a good tip. So everybody, I want to thank you. Um, this was excellent. I think great information for rehab and, and, and true insight in terms of uh, Dr. Wynn and his practice. So again, thank you guys very much. And thank Cora for uh, inviting us and uh, everybody have a great night. Thank you.